Welcome back to Analytical Chefs. We have a great episode for you today. I'm your host, Sergio, and I'm here with our special guest, Ramon, a.k.a. Ruam. Welcome, Ruam. Thank you, Sergio. Much appreciated. Extremely happy to be here. Honored, proud. Thank you for having me on the podcast, and I'm, I'm excited to where the conversation leads us. What inspired that name? Typical to like the greatest stories ever told. It starts with alcohol. <laughs> And also, I, you're talking about rum. <laughs> <laughs> well, ironically enough, my initials are rum. It's Ramon Umas. And when you spell out rum, I was like, I'm not going to write rum. It just sounds odd to be called you know, after a libation. So when you say the, the letter M, it, it at least phonetically, it sounds like there's an E in front of the letter when you say it, right? So I thought, let's put those together. Are you E-M, hence room? Have any of your clients ever asked you, like, how do you pronounce that or no? Yeah, all the time. They're like, is it room? Is it room? I think lately a lot of folks are adding accents to things. So yeah, so I go by Ramon or room, however anyone feels comfortable. I'm one in the same. There is a, a dichotomy to personalities and to what you share with the world. Um, but all in all, I'm one person. I was explaining to you the brand of analytical chefs. So any guests that come on the show are analytical chefs. That's what I perceive of them. People that are just thoughtful. You being invited here, I consider you a very critical thinker. You have a depth of information and knowledge and wealth of knowledge to, to share. You're a career banker career artist, career father. When you look back retrospectively, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, hindsight, 2020 and all that jazz. String theory, like every decision that you make leads forth your path. You wouldn't be here where you're at today, right? Yeah, like I wouldn't change anything. So exactly, because- Even the struggling downs, parts. The struggle brought you to your current state and X amount of years later, you're here. And I, did I tell you the story of my grandpa? He had the opportunity to like invest in Burger King. What year was that? Sixties. So in the the beginnings of of BK, and the story goes that for him to raise the capital, he had to sell off, uh, I think, a little restaurant that he had because my grandfather had a lot of F and B businesses, food and beverage, a cafeteria, a little corner store and that's here in the u.s new york and then also in, in miami so that's how he moved he sold everything in new york then came down then my dad was a sickly kid i think he had to sell off something to come up with the capital to go into that business I brought it up to my grandma his wife at the time and she was a staunch no way not gonna do it this is a for sure thing you already have this how are you gonna yeah Risk taking, that? especially in those days, is not exactly. common. Exactly. Had a, a big old fight, right? Words were said, actions were taken. And then I think back, it's like, okay, if my grandfather would have ignored his wife, yeah, you know, where would he be would, today? Or where would he be today? By the way, rest in peace to your yeah, grandpa. Thank you. Rest in peace to both. Yeah. It's okay. They had my dad already. So would he, would, like, would my dad be Burger Prince? Like, where would he be? But then would he have gone to the same school? Would he have met my mom? Would he have? Yeah, exactly. It me? played out exactly it how it had to for you and I to be sitting here today. Exactly. So it's like it, something that could have probably been life-changing, literally and figuratively, life-changing for them as a family, as a unit. Okay, life-changing for me. I probably wouldn't have been born. Yeah. So it's funny, right, how life turns out. We don't ask to be born. We're not jumping in, in the bodies of our parents and say, hey, maybe there's something that the little tadpole that wins, right? Yeah. That's perseverance in itself. <laughs> but we're not asked to be born. So we all should be Michael Phelps of the world. Maybe. I, I don't have the wings. <laughs> because all of us like swam through the adversity. Right? <laughs> our kids don't ask to be a part of this world. So we have an inherent responsibility, in my opinion. Hey, man, bringing a life into this world in whatever social class you're in, it's hard. It's not easy, right? You, you have to care for it. You have to give it nutrition, shelter, instill a sense of morals. I tell my children all the time, your mom and I, your parents are your first ever teachers. Mm -hmm. We're the first ones to ever teach you anything. You learn how to walk because of us. You learn how to crawl. You learn how to eat. 
all these things which are inherently needed for survival in this world we're the ones that teach you first we're the ones that instill the morals we're the ones that are teaching you numbers and everything the colors sure we have help with public broadcasting pbs i love you guys shouts out to sesame street and mickey mouse clubhouse and all that stuff they're not sponsoring this i'm just giving you shouts yeah yeah you get education in, in those forms too especially in your early ages but still man like it's a responsibility that we all have being a child of the 80s okay you were raised on reruns and sitcoms and reruns of sitcoms. That no, you had to have a lot of patience because you had to wait. Oh, yeah, if yeah, you yeah. tune in and it's 15 minutes in, yeah, you're like, oh yeah, man, yeah, I got to wait till next week to get yeah. this again. If, if you're lucky. <laughs> now it's on if demand. They ever, if, they ever, <laughs> I know, if they ever replay that show. Yeah, man. And we would get these moral teachings from this magical box that these artists, in essence, created for us to consume. I think sometimes as humans we look towards inspiration too much right mm -hmm. and sometimes man you just rest in peace my mentor lebo man you gotta work just gotta get up just gotta just do it you have almost two decades of banking experience right you're a career banker yeah. but you're also a career artist because you started doing art as a kid as far as i can remember some of my earliest memories were and, and told to me by parents and stuff like that is hey you were always doodling on your books as a toddler i would say i remember four or five i vividly remember one of my first drawings ever and trying to figure out hands mm. i was like five years old then fast forward to i was like around seven years old and my dad for a short period of time wasn't a part of my life but i recall that i would receive letters in the mail from him and these letters typically had words from pop and drawings and these drawings they weren't rudimentary they were pretty good and then popeye mickey mouse uh, superman batman mm -hmm. and then those packages that would come to the mail would get even cooler because sometimes they would have a comic book with it and then i would see in his letters I would see that, like, a Spider-Man was traced from the comic book on the, oh, nice. on the page. And then, so aside from the hands drawings that I was doing, like, at five, fast forward a few years later, and I recall in second grade, I'm getting applauded from the class and the teacher because I drew a really cool Spider-Man. And I think that was, those were, like, the catalyst moments. And ever since then, I was drawing every day of my life, inventing my own superheroes. I like really got into comics. I wanted to be a, a comic book illustrator. Mm -hmm. um, in middle school, my, my art teacher, she opened the world to like other artists and other art. I learned about Frida Kahlo. I learned about Roy Lichtenstein and different artists. Couple that with the comic books that I loved. And one of my favorite Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles that are uh -huh. after, arguably, the four greatest Renaissance painters. And I studied those painters because of the names that I learned from the cartoon and the comics. And I'm like, man, this world of art starts to really open up to me. I, I attend the Visual Arts Honors Conservatory. I was accepted at day. And then, like, all that stuff. Was know, that your first mural that you did? Yes, that was my first official mural. Up in those days, in my late teens, I was a relatively rambunctious kid that would sneak out of my house and I would paint my name onto walls. So my first official mural was at a North Campus. And secretly, I, had, I would have had two murals at the location, but when the decision committee found out that it was the same artist, they gave one of the mural designs to someone else. So that would have been cool, but whatever. I went to that art school and then also I studied digital media uh, as well. And when I moved away to Orlando, I recall having a conversation with my pop. I'm like, hey, pop, man, I need health insurance. <laughs> like, <laughs> I need to take care of myself. And I had a, a crappy job at a sneaker store and he reads a, he was reading the newspaper. Always, we read newspapers a lot. And he told me, I just read an article or something and I was talking to another guy and he said that the fastest growing industry for Hispanics, for Latins, is finance. 
So I took it, took the little nugget. And within a week, there was a career fair at school at, at UCF. I'm like, let's see if there's any prospects or something. I go, and when I speak to someone, a representative at a bank, and they're a recruiter for a bank, and she starts going through my resume. I was prepared and to do a good impression, have my resume and everything. And she starts looking at it. Oh, you work at, at such the a shoe store at that time? Sneaker store. I was like, yeah. So you're like, oh, Al Bundy is? I got my inspiration from him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, <in> my... <laughs> and then prior to that, I sold electronics at Sears, the car stereos and stuff like that. But I think the biggest catalyst was at such a young age, I had like my own pool company. And, and you were an entrepreneur from the get I was an entrepreneur. Thanks. My pop was always very supportive and he helped out a lot. It was the, the company truck was his pickup truck. So I, like I had my own little company and she was like, man, you have a lot of sales experience. I think you'd be a great banker. Lady, I, didn't, I have no idea what you're talking about. I have a checking and a savings account. I, I know how to my register. I know how to make sure I don't overdraft, but I know nothing about banking. She sets up the the appointment with a branch manager. And, and I'm thinking to my head, I just wanted health insurance man. Yeah, <laughs> and a decent job. You need to get out of retail because retail really sucks. No offense to any of the retail folks out there, but I know it's extremely hard. That's hectic. It's hectic. It's hard. The holiday season. I started in retail as well. When I have this meeting, right, with the branch manager, the same, like the same response was given. And I'm like, hey, lady, I just want to be a teller. I know nothing about banking, all that stuff. And she kept on urging me and pushing me. And I, she saw something within myself that I didn't see. I'll never forget her, Jody Carter. If she's with us, shout out to Jody Carter. If not, then her memory lives very well within me because she saw it like, and she gave me a shot. That's amazing. And I told her, okay, I'll accept the position on a trial basis. Um, <laughs> you gave yourself a probationary yeah, period? <laughs> I gave myself a probationary period. I'm like, look, we'll, we'll, I'll do it for three months. And after the three months, we'll get together. You tell me how I'm doing. And if I'm not doing well, if I'm not up to par, I'm okay with being demoted as a teller. And then I'll work my way up. But I do get benefits, right? <laughs> <laughs> And she took it. She was like, okay, she accepted my offer. So I started, That's hilarious. I started working. And then fast forward to three months, three months come around. I got, I, I took time on her calendar. I booked time on her calendar. I asked her, hey, so Jody, like, how am I doing? She was like, okay, I have news for you. And I'm already expecting, oh man, here it comes. She was like, yeah, I want to promote you to be a senior banker. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? I think I'm 22 years old or something at that time and i was like the youngest senior banker that they had at, of course at that office and when i would go to trainings everyone would flip out like how young are you she was like you brought in the most deposits you've opened the most accounts a lot of people like you i see a good future a big future for you and at that point i really went head first into this world into that world of finance so much so that Today, I'm a very seasoned banker. I have a lot of gray hair to prove it. Mm -hmm. Close to, like you said. Close That's a seasoning that yeah, they added on you. The extra salt. <laughs> and I'm in commercial banking. So I service clients that are multi-million dollars in annual revenues. And it's it could be a very humbling and rewarding industry. I appreciate it. I enjoy it. It's difficult. I live with a constant sense of, of duality because getting into the art thing, using both sides of my brain at mm -hmm. the time is tough. Yeah. Um, but since I, I dove deep into this world, I saw that it's lucrative financially. I can support a family. Yeah. This is your bread and butter my, my and it sustains butter. your lifestyle. Yeah. But you still have the creativity okay. aspect that you, it's a, yeah. It's an endeavor that you're obviously, you blossomed yeah. it as well. Yeah. But throughout all that time, 15 years, I had completely neglected my other passion, which was art. So for 15 years, I didn't pick up a paintbrush. I, I would doodle here and there, and I never really went into this world, into the art world, until again, 
someone saw something within me that I hadn't seen before. And I don't mean to get so long-winded, but um, I think it's important to give credit where credit's due. And in 2019, I went on a nice vacation with my family and I experienced the world of art auctions on a cruise. And I picked up a few pieces. Hey, it's a little bit of money. I love art so much. And that was in a foreign country, you said? On a cruise, it was in the Caribbean. And how was the auction there, like the feel, the vibe? Coming from a creative and loving to be surrounded by art, it's fun, it's exciting. And then as you get more experience with it, then you start to see the pros and the cons of that world. But what I think was like, that was that experience. It opened up my eyes into fine arts. And then the design of the ship in itself. Um, I was surrounded, like the theme was masters, like great masters. So you had pieces and murals on the walls of Monet, Degas. Um, wow. They didn't have any pop art, but you start seeing some romanticism paintings, some pieces of Van Gogh, but all over art in the ship on the stairwells and stuff like that. And I'm like, man, like I'm immersed in this experience. And I bought a few pieces, an original piece, some G. Clay pieces, some prints. And I get home and I'm just inspired. I'm speaking to my barber. My barber likes to paint as well. A shout out to Javi, my groomman. And, and he tells me about the art store that he goes to. So I'm like, okay, let me go. I go on weekend. I leave with a shopping cart full of stuff. <laughs> I start painting. We had moved and my son was moving into like his big boy room and I asked him hey man do you want something on your walls and stuff like that and, and I'm already thinking oh I can't wait to paint a spider-man and a batman or whatever stuff that kind of pulled out my heartstrings <laughs> and the kid tells me he wants a space room <laughs> I'm like okay I love <laughs> I, we love space and everything that deals with astrophysics and all this stuff so then I took it upon myself to create a mural for him and it took two months on my off days and I, I did a huge mural and it's okay awesome he loved it the unveiling was awesome so I had all these little things and I started diddle daddle and paint all over again and that auction house from the chip invites my wife and I to attend a weekend paid by them to experience for some of their more more impressive pieces. Or maybe impressive is the wrong word, but just other pieces and more original work and all that. Maybe it's exclusive. Yeah. It's a VIP event. It's nice. What call it. And we go, we have an amazing... On that note though, like how are art dealers or galleries, how, they actually choose who's going to purchase art or how does that work? Yeah. Uh, so the way that, that these guys worked, it's based on, on spent. If you go during the cruise and you spend X amount of money with them, then they invite you to the VIP event, mm. which is typically like a land event where it's like at a hotel, they, they put up your stay. And then the idea is, okay, you pay them back when you buy art. Okay. Um, so there is, from my understanding, they don't invite just anyone. They invite folks that have already spent some money with them. And then you'd start to level up. Yeah, you're building a rapport with them and a reputation. And I, so the story, like the kid that did Harry Potter, Daniel Radcliffe, I heard that this guy was at an auction and he fell in love with a piece and he said, oh, I want to buy this. And then the gallery said no. So that's... They said, I'm sorry, we're going to hold off to yeah. somebody that is a known art collector or something like that. that. Elitism. It's the tastemakers. They're the ones that are creating the market and the demand falsely. Could be because who knows if it even was earmarked for some. Yeah. A more credible collector or whatever the case. A, it could have been a whole bunch of hot air. People in control. Yeah. So you have the art galleries mm -hmm. and then you have individuals that don't have a brick and mortar place where they're going to actually put the pieces on display. So that right there, that's a gray area of concern because if I'm trusting an unknown person sure. to be a middleman and they don't have a reputation, I'm a little skeptical when it comes to that. Part, or they just dressed apart. The art world, 
is a really small world when you think about it. Last year was like a 68 billion. Yeah, dollars. in the 60s. I was about to tell you that. 62, 60 something. And the biggest consumers is the US is like 40 something percent. Yeah, the right. UK and then China. When you think of it in grand scheme of things, there's companies that make a lot more. Like one company that you probably have never even heard of makes a lot more than $68 billion a year. So that means that the barrier of entry is quite high and, and the consumer is quite small. Mm -hmm. A lot more people are going to buy a jacket, pair of jeans, sneakers yeah. versus high-end art or even beginner art, folks that are trying to get into this market. So with those barriers of entry, create um, a small small ecosystem where there's only a select few galleries that really make markets and make and break out artists like Damien Hurst and Coons and things like that. Mm -hmm. Even one of my favorite and the great Basquiat. Mm -hmm. So if you happen to be aligned with those galleries and auction houses, then of course you have a much higher probability of being a successful artist. And successful, I use air quotes. Yeah, that's objective. Uh, because there's artists that we've never heard of that probably have M's. In yeah, as far as talent, and, maybe and, they and should have surpassed talented. somebody else and they didn't. Yeah. So those tastemakers and market makers, um, it goes back to the elitism where they're, they'll cater to those with the biggest pockets. You can walk us through, let's say, all the players mm -hmm. as far as art goes, right? Starting with the art gallery. Oh. And going down agents, curators, and even the critics have an influence Absolutely. on what people are going to ultimately buy. Absolutely. All of these things, like any industry, are barriers of entry. Some would argue that are needed to create industry. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, these layers are, in essence, ways to keep people out. Yeah, to create that supply and demand and that create supply. Number one of the original rule of economics. And it's definitely an economy. Sixty eight billion, sixty eight billion, mm -hmm. right? Or sixty billion or whatever. Yeah, yeah, it's over sixty. Yeah. So I think but I think it starts with the artisan itself. Because you need the artisan to create the art. Now, arguably, there are certain people that would say the gallery owners and stuff, they can dictate who's an artist. Mm -hmm. This painting could be very different than a contemporary master that just did a dot. Yeah, shout out to you for shout drawing that. I love that painting. Again. That's an original too. It is an OG. It's an original. And you're an OG. <laughs> so it starts with the artisan and then artisans can go multiple different ways. And I think social media has really changed the landscape of what was the traditional route. But typically, the artisan has some sort of pedigree associated with them. What school they went to, how many pieces, how many shows that they've been a part of. Are they self-made or do they have a lot of money backing them to create the talent? Mm -hmm. Because art, yeah, it is something that I think everyone has an inherent skill and in creativity in any which way. Mm -hmm. They can make art. I consider myself more of a colorist. I born and raised in Miami. I've adapted my art deco, the Miami's art deco time period to influence my choice of color. Okay. Okay. And then when I paint out, there is an emotion and it's really tied to who I am at my core, being for having family from the Caribbean as well. The Caribbean is known for very bright, vibrant paintings. Mm -hmm. vibrant That's colors. tropical nature. Tropical nature, the pinks, the blues, the magentas, purples, that part of the spectrum. Being a, a child of the 80s, I was born in 82. So what was the color scheme at that time? Oh, the fluorescence in the, in the 80s and 90s, fluorescence. Hmm. So I'm attracted to that. And it's also part of my story, my culture, and my influences. And that's what I put on canvas. Do I advertently express that out to people if they ask i'll tell them like hey this is my thought process in terms of my color theory and what i use can now the gallery owner or the salesperson embellish that sure and in essence 
help create further demand on the guy because of my thought process and my technique. Yeah, by all means, and they're going to because it goes back to what this is. It's an industry, right? It's an economy. 60 billion bucks is a lot. It's a lot more than certain countries' GDP. Yeah. So in essence, to get back to your question, it starts with the artisan. It get, then it goes to some sort of representation, whether it's a manager, an agent, or a gallery owner. Or a gallery owner it could be your agent and your manager. Mm. And then there's also outside of that, galleries in South Florida, there's a lot. There's plenty of galleries and opportunity there. But there's also then another tier, which is auction houses. When you go from Sotheby's, Sotheby's Christie's, Park West, um, there's several auction houses. And they work differently. Typically, it's they're both the gallery owner and the auction house works on a consignment type basis. They get X amount of percentage. Although the gallery owner, from my understanding, industry wide, is like a 50 50 split with an artist. Other artists could have a different type of arrangement. And then auction houses are more on driving price up. To collect. Yeah, marking up the uh, premium. They're selling things at a premium, but then also you have a buyer's premium that is paid. And there's reserves place too. Yeah, and which is, think of the most expensive type of eBay store mm -hmm. right? that is only really catering to the affluent and whatnot. You set your price tag or the industry sets your price tag. When I said about like social media, change the landscape immensely because now you can go B to C, your business, or A to C, artist to client. Yeah. Like you set your price point, but then the industry in itself, if you're not recognized by one of these galleries where they put you down. Mm. Has a critic analyze any of your paintings? No. I've received some press, and then there were announcements, I think, on Forbes. I've been approached by, and I've done a couple of interviews. But no, I haven't had any in-depth analysis. I spoke with an auction house at one point that seemed to be impressed with my work, but I don't think that I'm at the capacity to play in that space just yet because consider an auction house is, hey, you need to have a breadth of work, a large portfolio that you can bring out to do a show. I'm currently trying to build that out, but that as takes time and yeah. creative does too. My first Art Basel event, 2019. So it was at the Confidante Hotel, my first ever like real show. It was a group show. Or it was a group show that was coordinated and prepared by my mentor, Lebo. Or yeah. Levitard. Rest in peace, Lebo. Going back to like my story. Full circle. Making it full circle. That year in 2019, when I spent some money, I did the mural for my kid. I am invited to that VIP event. Um, I had seen Lebo's work through video, and also I experienced it on that art auction that I did in the cruise ship. It was striking. I became a fan. And then I, I saw a video of him expressing his thought process and all that, and I'm like, man, this guy seems like a, a good dude, really cool guy. Then fast forward some months later, when we go to this event, and he happens to be one of the artists that they're showcasing, showcase three artists. And he was the last guy, a uh, native of South Florida. The story, I'm like, wow, man, there's like a lot of connections there between my story and his story in terms of upbringing Cuban parents and child of immigrants, et cetera. The funny <laughs> guy doesn't take himself too seriously very much like myself and then what kind of topped it off so i already loved his work i loved his story i loved his personality and then he's wearing a t-shirt of what's considered like your favorite rapper's favorite rapper which is a guy named mf doom and i'm like man <laughs> how are you wearing this t-shirt of some obscure rapper that not everyone knows nowhere near the mainstream in a room full of all these social wealthy <laughs> people, he, he does. They do the unveiling of his of his pieces. 
he's available there just standing around. And I went up to him and I'm like, hey man, like dope shirt. And from that moment on, it was like we were friends. Um, and we spent time. That's talking. funny. Nobody probably asked him about that shirt. Yeah. Because exactly. I didn't even know anything. Yeah. Uh, I was like, yo, dope shirt. Like, I, I love MF Doom too. And he's like, yeah, I can't believe that someone can <laughs> rap this obscure. And we're talking hip hop. And I'm a huge hip hop head. And we just hit it off. And then enter my wife, like, stage left. And she was like, oh, you know that he's an artist too. And I look at her, I'm like, no, I don't. Like, we're here. No, don't plug me. <laughs> and I especially I haven't picked up a paintbrush in all these years. And he was like, oh, yeah, you have stuff that you can show me? I'm like, again, awkward, being humble and all that stuff. And she was like, oh, yeah. No, that's beautiful. Yeah. Because imagine if you were soliciting, it, like when you stop an artist, hey, Kanye, great, but here's my mixtape, man. It's all, yeah, man. Mixtape. But that naturally yeah. manifested. It just happened. And so he knew your intentions were not even there. To, like for that, you were praising him. Like, like <laughs> you were praising him, man. I love your story. I love your work. I love that. Uh, all that beautiful. stuff. And he asked to see someone. Well, I'm good. Don't worry about it. Let's go back to you, whatever. And, and I know he has to, has to work the room because, hey, this is a business. All my years of banking and finance. Have taught me like, hey, I gotta let the business work. I can help them in one way, but the other way, you gotta do it yourself. So that's my thought. I'm like, look, I just want to get to know you for a little bit and peace out, do your thing. And who knows? Maybe I even become a collector one day, and all that stuff. And she was like, oh, he just finished our son's uh, mural in his room. I was like, oh, you got a picture of it? Let me see it. And he was in, more enthusiastic about it than I was. Yeah, you're like, oh god, like, okay, <laughs> like, here you go. And he started seeing, like, wow, this is pretty cool. How'd you do it? I was like, no, I did it with spray paint. You did all this with spray paint? I'm like, yeah, man. It took me a while, but. Through your career in yeah. graffiti. Yeah. yeah, that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> Part two. We, we were talking, and then I told him the same story I shared about that. I went to this, the cruise and all this, and I'm surrounded. I came back inspired and, like, finally picking up a paintbrush. And he proceeds to say, hey, look, get my number. Let's, let's continue to talk what like you sell millions of dollars guy you're an internationally known artist he's painted the whole cruise ship what are you doing you don't have to mess with me man and he was like no take my number okay sure and i'm thinking like oh it's his manager's number or something like whatever so i i, I collect the number we, we go our separate ways and then i see him around hey what's up but he, I, i'm letting him work the room you got to get your numbers up you got to make some sales yeah stuff like that and then at the end of the night, I was like, you know what? Let's test this. And I send a text message to that number. I'm like, hey, man, it was cool meeting you. I appreciate the kind words. And I expected it just to go to the void, black hole. And within two minutes, I get a response back. Oh, man, it was great to meet with you. Keep on working and use this experience to develop your art and follow through with that passion i'm like okay cool man so then i start sketching and drawing and i send him a couple of sketches here and things like that that i worked on and he was like oh that's really cool and then at that point he starts to like give me advice pointers and oh try this thing i just bought this and it's helped me with my development in art so then i went out and bought it hundred dollars on freaking crayons mm -hmm. um i showed them a picture now what type of crayons like something that you've never used before never no there's some pastels i get activated with water and i did a sketch of my dog oh wow. and I, I and i showed him hey look i bought it and i did this and what do you think and we start to develop a, a a cool friendship late night talks philosophical if you're familiar with his work he really fills up his images with thoughts of mythology and just really thought-provoking pieces and as our relationship grows he's starting to become more of my mentor invites me to the studio hey let's chat let's hang out hey i'm doing this and and i'm still developing my stuff and i start buying canvases and i start painting and then it gets to a point where he's hey look i'm curating this thing would you be interested i'm like whoa 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 where did this come from? I'm not even soliciting any of this stuff. I guess that's, hey, okay. but if I give you a shot, it's got to be good stuff. Yeah, you got to represent. I'm not going to just put you on. And So then I would start working on stuff. And then we're, and he really helped me. And I had two months, two months mm -hmm. to create a body of work. And he helped me think of like having cohesive stories, stories. Yeah, your brand. And, and I'm trying, I'm racking my head trying to figure out 
visual style voice that kind of stuff and then through his mentorship my thought and being really introspective and kicking at the things that i feel that make me i came up with this story and then i started sending him pictures and he's all oh, this is good stuff oh this is good and then someone's hey can you be at this such and such place at eight o'clock at night or whatever at the beach and i'm like okay had you already painted this painting no Okay. Your inspiration for the Japanese art infused with the Miami theme. Like, where did the Japanese influence come from? Yeah. So my father had a Kung Fu school when I was a kid. Um, and I always grew into martial arts. I love Asian culture. I love culture. And then the Japanese aesthetic and the way that that certain traditionalism is had and all this. So that's one of my influences. But like, as far as the geisha goes in so particular? The geisha, then we're talking and the concept of story, like what, what's the story that you, that you want to tell? And one of my most successful pieces in art school was when we went into this topic of juxtaposition. And juxtaposition is getting two things that have nothing to do with each other. And merging them into one. So the the piece I remember it fondly. It was it was a big success with the whole class, and it was even showcased in a student art show. It is a nude woman that's pretty like strong, athletic woman. I was very much into DJing and music and stuff. And she had two turntables for breasts hmm. and a light socket or electrical socket in her um, crotch. Yeah. Okay. And then she's in a sassy pose, like holding the electrical cord, okay. plug me in kind of thing. And I love the juxtaposition concept. So I'm like, what are things that I love? I love the Asian culture. I love Japan. And of course, Miami. So then it started to fuse. And how do I get them to fuse together? Mm -hmm. And it was, what if we have 14th, 15th century geishas time traveled and transported to, to modern day Miami? or just transport into Miami in itself. And how do they assimilate in my culture? And what would they look like today? And then that's where the, that was the story. Where I called them the Miami geishas and I had three strong pieces and then some like two smaller companion ones. And this one's called the cafecito geisha. Imagine the geisha, it's her first time ever tasting Cuban coffee and espresso. Mm -hmm. She's her eyes are are open. She has a smirk. The nectar of the gods. That's why the thing is is gold leafed. And she's in bliss and happy. You're tasting something that is knocking out your senses because they don't drink espresso in mm -hmm. Japan. So imagine in, for lack of a better phrase, a restrictive type of individual because it's about geishas is about being very graceful but restricted movements, showing this emotion when they just tasted something very, extremely foreign to them. And he enjoyed it a lot. And he was like, okay, this is it. So I showed up at the hotel where it was going to be had. And he let me choose what wall I wanted. He actually challenged me to go into a larger wall. I wasn't that comfortable at that time. Nowadays, hell yeah. But at that moment, I was like, no, it was my first kind of thing. And I did feel a bit like fish out of water imposter syndrome that was your first event though right first event as a grown-up and actually doing like i had been part of like student shows and things like that when i was younger mm -hmm. but this is like my first legit real deal it's art basel 2019 it was announced and then publicized it it's uh, with the confidante hotel it's part of the hyatt group and hundreds of people were going to attend so it was like a massive deal talk about trial by fire i would call him i'll call him my calcifer and calcifer is a character in a in an anime movie which is a never-ending fire and i'll be like man you're the fire up my ass you're the one that lit it yeah he was motivating you as well motivating me, pushing me and mentoring me so is that an amazing experience to this day it's probably my my most top fulfilling experience so you never forget your first kind of thing mm -hmm. and i had his support the whole time and though he let me do my thing and i would reach out here and there and i always knew that he had my back and then fast forward towards the end of the show which is typically artwork will stay on the walls for about eight weeks 
I find out I'm the only one that sold. Oh, wow. So I sold a piece out of all the people that were there. Nice. And I'm like, wow, man. Like, this art thing has legs. I was a part of a mural project for that experience in that show. Two beautiful giant murals or a group of four. Shout out to 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 Carlos Solano, a, a friend of mine that I made through Lebo, King Red, a Life. These guys were all a part of the project. And because of this experience, I'm confident in the pieces that I do. Again, I'm I constantly have a commission piece waiting and I've done murals, public, private, and I already have a little staple of collectors of people that follow me. And on top of that, I, because of him and his subtle nudges, um, this year I, I participated in my first art fairs and they went really well. And these are little nuggets of experience that, that he left me. And honestly, again, he saw something that I didn't see within myself. It was there. I just didn't realize it. And being a fire, being a catalyst, being a nudger and helping me to build. And then now I have a mentor to look at his career path and what he did to achieve what he wanted. But the greatest thing that I'll never be able to tell him anymore is he taught me that it was possible. And if it's possible, man, to follow that dream, to follow that passion, why not? Yeah, man. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to doing more work and sharing it with the world, sharing it with family, friends. And, and where is it that the audience can find your work? I have a, a website. This is room.com. And on Instagram, it's this is room. Um, you could go to the, that hotel Confedante, which mm -hmm. is on Collins and like 41st, 42nd, you'll see the mural in the 10th floor. And then you'll see another mural on the ground floor going to the pool. I'm going to start working on another mural exterior in Alapata. So that's going to be extremely fun, but extremely challenging. Mm -hmm. My largest mural to date. And oh, congrats. Thank you, man. So looking forward to unveiling that and just continue to putting work out there, man. In the art space, have you ever witnessed the loophole when you use shell companies to purchase art? But that's like more like the fine art space, right? Mm -hmm. How many levels are there? So what you're saying is like fraud and stuff in the art world. I have experienced some attempts of to be defrauded and I understand given my experience given what i what my nine to five is and things along those lines so i've had folks reach out to me on social media and say hey look i, I really love your artwork and your style do you do commissions and i'd like to commission you etc and starting this long lengthy dialogue where in turn at the end saying what's your rate what do you charge you give a number and they say, I'll send you a check for two times the amount. Mm. You cash it and then send me the difference with the art. I've had a situation where a gallery representation has come to me saying, hey, look, I love your pieces. Let's talk. Let's showcase your work. Let's put your stuff here. And within a month or so, close the gallery down and the person disappears and it's just, now are those virtual galleries or physical galleries physical gallery where they wanted to hold pieces and some of mm -hmm. my favorite stuff that hey we'll dictate the market for you we'll help build up your price tag and then that person disappears and it's yeah it's like a too good have, to be true scheme you're like we have to be if, if somebody's approaching you yeah What's some of the thoughts that might have crossed your mind is probably like, I'm flattered, but how did you even hear about me or? Yeah, of course. And are these profiles like ghost profiles or are they just normal people? Maybe they hacked them. Like, do you look at how many people are following them Absolutely. I, and their physical location? Yeah. Given, you know, I'm not spring chicken. Like I've been around, mm -hmm. around the block a bit, book smarts and street smarts and all of that helps. And through my like nine to five, you develop a, a pretty keen sense of intuition mm -hmm. and being on the theme of your show, analytical chef, you try to peel back the onion. So you do research. I'm not going to get 
I'm not saying that I'll never be scammed. I'm saying that it's going to be yeah, harder you're, for someone exactly. to scam me versus versus not. So yeah, these profiles have been legitimate people. Uh, it could be someone that was hacked. It could be a ghost profile. The gallery, like I went to go meet with them. I walked the gallery. Oh, really? It's someone that it was connected to someone else that I know. That kind of stuff. Uh, oh, wow. So this was a, like a referral situation? Not a referral. Uh, supposedly the story was a, he saw my work. He saw a, and he saw that I was connected to someone that he's connected to. And you know, maybe through the friends list, saw that I'm an artist. He represents artists. He was a uh, part owner of a gallery. And like I said, just like out of nowhere, just completely fell off the face of the earth. And I, I go back to some of those red flags, like very insistent on getting my work out there. Yeah, that urgency is a red flag. It's a red flag. And all these grandiose thoughts, which were very cool, and I could get behind behind some of them. But at that point, they appeal to your better nature, right? If you're an artist, your idea is to have the world see and appreciate my art. Mm -hmm. It's in essence like a captive audience. I'm the resource that you need to put it out yeah. there. All those things which play against your better nature on, to a lot of people that could be defrauded in that way. Um, and again, just disappeared. No answers to any of my follow-up calls, emails, messages. And I just think, where would my artwork be? Mm. It could be in a storage unit. It could have been sold. And then did they ask you for any documentation to support the art, like a certificate of authenticity that you have to provide or um, typically it, the gallery provides that? No, typically I, I personally do pieces that will, will receive one. Because I know a lot of forgeries occur with that, that people get conned yeah. into believing a piece is authentic when it isn't. In so how can the audience kind of be proactive and defend themselves towards something like that? Yeah. Provenance is extremely important. So provenance is proof. Um, in any way, shape, or form. So it's certificates, it's photos, it's understanding what the lineage and ownership of that artwork is. So for me personally, every like original piece that I sell, I register it. So I have a living database with... And you register that, but on your own database? or on do you... own, Yeah, on my own database. There's nowhere to register that officially, like with the state or something? I wish there was. And I think that talks about the lack of regulation within the mm -hmm. industry. And if you look back at a few, just a few years ago, where I think the thought process, the original thought process of of nfts and blockchain technology i think it came from a good place up until bad actors went into that space speculators used that to defraud a lot of folks mm -hmm. i think the thought was a good one i think it came from a good place to have a registry to find a lineage of ownership okay from the creator to the acquirer and so on and so forth, and in turn even help monetize. Because typically when an art piece from an artist is sold, you sold the rights of that original artwork to the purchaser, the buyer. Mm -hmm. The buyer can then in turn sell that for whatever dollar amount over what they paid for. Hey man, that was a good investment on, on the acquirer, right? But then the artist only saw compensation for that initial transaction. So I'll give you an example. Banksy is a great, prolific painter from the 90s. And he would do these works of art out in the public space. And he did it for social commentary. And there were art dealers that were chiseling the concrete, the wall out and selling this or if it was a, a pasted thing taking it off and selling it and reselling it and all that and banksy didn't make a penny for any of these pieces just recently this past year as a guy that was found guilty for fraud wire fraud seven years um, in prison 
and I think he defrauded $86 million off of investors and selling pieces over and never. Yeah, inflating the value, right? Inflating value or selling a piece for a collector. So like on consignment and saying that he sold the piece, never really did sell it to the person's intended, sold it to someone else and still telling these folks that, hey, I still have ownership and trying to resell the same piece over mm. and over to other folks and collecting money and then using those pieces that never sold, that he already collected money on to hold as collateral for a loan to continue to finance his lifestyle. Wow. Yeah. So it, is it, it, does it run rampant in the world of art? I can only assume so. Even a concept of money laundering or tax evasion. But yeah, it's definitely there. It's definitely there. But now our question back is, show me an industry where that can't happen. I, I, can, I don't think there is one, right? I think it's just, there's bad actors. If somebody is very wealthy and they bought this $80 million piece mm -hmm. and then they store it offshore and it's like a museum that sure. is for the eyes of no one <laughs> because it's confidential. I'm a legitimate fine art purchaser. I want to store it and preserve the art. I don't want obviously it's to- It's an asset, right? It's an asset. Yeah. So you're not going to pay sales tax. But this goes hand in hand with the 1031 exchange. Yeah. If you sold your property today yeah. and you put that money yeah. in a 1031 exchange, it's a strategy move. But you have 45 days to, to execute. It's not indefinite or any of that. Yeah. So you have a certain window of time. So then, okay, wait, I'm going to buy another property now. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Tax deferred. Like you have to use knowledge where it applies. You're not going to be ignorant to things that might assist you. So if you can manage around the law for sure. Oh. Yeah. So in, in a way, if I'm, gonna, if I'm a very wealthy person buying fine art and I say, I think the strategy of me establishing a holding company, which you have a holding company, it really serves no other purpose than holding title to something. Sure. So if I don't want to be a target to a kid being kidnapped or ransom wise, being a target because people think, oh, this guy has a painting that's worth millions of dollars. I'm going to go after it. Then it makes sense to buy in a confidential manner. And then you have it stored in the best facilities. Yeah. Why not? But not everybody's doing it for the right reasons. No. Some people are, are actually have counterfeit items in the same storage facility that other people have legitimate ones. But at the end of the day, do what you can to protect yourself, protect your assets, protect your information, right? And we share our information every single mm -hmm. day when we're scrolling on these supercomputers that are in our pockets. Mm -hmm. I'm a strong proponent of that. Uh, my my family laughs at me, my wife specifically. I don't even do facial on my phone, even though I'm sure that it already knows my face. Yeah. No, it's um, funny you say that. Yeah. The only, the facial recognition, yeah. Androids, yeah. they got hacked. You can get a mannequin of your face yeah. and just unlock. The only ones that didn't get broken into were Apple's, well, Apple. Apple iPhones. Yeah. So I'm all for protecting yourself, right? and and your information people don't know if i own original art or if i don't people don't know that you have your own professional affiliations and your own personal financial statements mm -hmm. and things like that and when you see your taxes you have and if you have a corporation there's a balance sheet that shows the worth of your own company mm -hmm. whether it's a shell company or not protection is key in doing what you can to care for yourself I talked about a bad actor that tried to defraud me in on social media and another bad actor that tried to steal my paintings within the art world specifically. There's bad actors, whether the institution or even the individual that's purchasing. So I have to know who is buying my artwork, who's buying my piece. I do research. I had one lady this year who I met at an art fair and she was like, oh, I love this painting. I love this piece. And would you sell it? And of course, that's why it's there. <laughs> and then she never came back. And I thought it was just a missed opportunity or just maybe it's just someone that really was admiring and didn't know how to tell me that she was admiring it just to admire for art's sake or appreciation's sake. And to say, oh, look, I want to buy it. I'll come back later. Maybe you know, people say that and that's fine. And a month later, she reaches out to me via Instagram. And hey, look, 
I can't stop thinking about your painting. So apparently it did its purpose and, and I want to purchase it. I didn't go blindly into the, yeah, sure. Where can I send it? You know, I said, where would it be hung? Is it local? Are you not local? Do you need help with installation? I looked through her Instagram. I looked through her website that was linked. Instagram. Like you did that for due diligence or for comfort that your painting is going to be hung somewhere you approve? Yeah. All of that. When someone comes to you as a creative and says, I believe in your voice, in your visual voice, in your message, in your skill set, and in your creativity, man, that is such a humbling moment for me. And it's a very emotional one because I know how hard I have to work, okay, to get a paycheck or to feed my family, or to pay for the lights, mm -hmm. shelter. I know how hard I have to work. And I put myself in those people's shoes to say, and art, all in all, really doesn't have an intrinsic value. It's the value, of what is the art is in the eye of the beholders. Holder, right? So, man, I know that I bust my back to make the money I make to purchase the things that I purchase and pay for the things that I pay. I put myself in those shoes. Man, how hard is that person worked yeah. to have the disposable income to purchase that piece from me? And in a sense, they're telling me, hey, I believe in you. I believe in your skill set. I believe in your voice. How can I not get this rush of emotion and feeling within me? In essence, that might be one of the reasons why I do what I do. Mm -hmm. I'm so appreciative. Man, it's a beautiful relationship and connection that we're doing. And then we're building it with one of my pieces of art that now no longer works and lives in my space. Now it's going to live in your space. Mm -hmm. And then even further, if you want to continue to peel back that onion, I remember every single brushstroke I do. I remember every single time that painting kicked my ass. I remember every single time that I walked away and, and in frustration or when I spilled paint on my clothes or when I grabbed my paintbrush and I scratched my head because I'm trying to figure something out. Like I remember these things. So I develop a bond with my piece. So for me to then, even though I'm being compensated for it, thank you. Um, it's hard to part ways. It's hard. It's, it's like, how do you say goodbye to your kid every morning? Mm -hmm. Man, that's rough. That's tough. Um, so it's, I'm, I'm imparting with you. So yeah, I, I, at least I'm not at, I'm at a level where I can still spend that time for that research and that background and making sure that I'm developing that personal connection with someone who knows what in the next five, 10 years will bring and how my art evolves and how my my perception will be but i know today man it means a lot to me i'm sure it'll mean a lot to me then but just in a different way so yeah man it's there's good and bad actors and protection is protection do what you can because the last thing i want is for me to go ahead and part ways with something Sure, I would hate to then see that my piece is hanging somewhere where I don't feel comfortable with it. Or that person just bought it to then flip it later. And then I'm like, man, I could have held on to it myself and I could have flipped it later and doubled up on my money. No, it's interesting that you're saying this because it goes back to Harry Potter, Daniel oh, Radcliffe. Yeah. So Radcliffe, if they would have sold them the painting, I don't see a risk. I, it definitely had to be the dealer's it's perception, elitism. what they wanted to do. There was It's elitism. Yeah, they wanted that to go somewhere for the, more of a controlled reason. You're just doing it for the best interest you know, of the piece. In a way now, what like branding, right? What's your brand? What's your brand associated with? What you wear, what you drive, branding, what purse you buy, what shoes. I can only assume that gallery had a specific brand that they wanted to protect. Yeah, tailor, exactly. The consumer. Uh, it, you know, and, and yeah, tailor to the consumer. But with that said, if you're discounting people due to elitism, 
it says no it's hand. very odd because it, it, it's not natural right but he fell in love with that piece yeah. and he was gonna pay millions of dollars for it it wasn't like he wanted a discount or anything so you're not gonna allow him to buy it so i wonder who even bought that <laughs> or if they even wanted to sell it that's maybe they couldn't part ways either maybe they couldn't or they were waiting for the oh they don't watch any of the harry potter flicks <laughs> <laughs> they're not fans they're like of, you no nah, not you bro <laughs> um, they're not fans of fantasy that's ironic just like any industry it's finicky it has good actors it has bad actors it can be used for positives and negatives it goes back to protecting yourself and it starts from the bottom floor up even understanding what the reputation of the auction house that you're dealing with who the auctioneers are those kinds of things, I would say, it's what, I'm not at that space, not that level yet, um, but it's something that I would be weary of. It's mm -hmm. something that I would do my research on because going back to the branding piece, that's who my brand is being associated with. And at the end of the day, we all have our own personal brand. The way, what we bring out to the world, what we share with the world, it's our brand. Hey, man, you know that guy, Sergio? He's such a great human being. He's got a great heart. Mm -hmm. That's your brand. That's why I say you can say whatever you want, but if you're not practicing what you preach, then you're not living your brand. Ruam, Ramon, I want to thank you so much for coming because pleasure. you've been a pleasure to speak to. Like, and I really appreciate your art and what you're bringing to the table in the art space. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with your audience, share them with a bit of my story, experience your story, and provide thoughtful intellectual conversation where it hopefully resonates with people and it'll help move something in a positive light for someone's life. And I know for sure that none of our time was wasted here. So thank you.